Hello, listener. Welcome to the Gaslight Collective. I am the Collector. Come along now. Let me show you my collection of audio delights. Yes, go on, pick one. Ah, it's all about choice, isn't it? And you've chosen well. You can always trust Victoria to pick a good story when you ride her lift. Let's begin. We will make you believe. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 2, Episode number 14 of The Lift. My name is Daniel Foytek, and I wanted to start off by saying thank you to everybody listening today. We always appreciate everybody who takes the time out of their busy schedule. Well, that's enough of that, isn't it? (laughs) I wanted to take a minute and talk to you, because the time has finally come for your choice. Yes, I'm talking to you, silly. Many things have happened to bring you to this point. To have you be here, listening at this very moment, it's kind of magic really, isn't it? That you can hear me, and that I'm talking to you. Now, this is a secret I need to tell you. Something it's taken this long to get to. Something you had to be ready for before you'd believe it. These stories are for you. All of them. The lift isn't just an elevator, it's much more, because it's your lift. It's a lift for all people who understand. The lift is an act of lifting you up to being the best person you can. It is you, your connection to others, how one's life can touch many and change them for the better. And how only a story can tell the truth in a way that changes everything. Whether you realise it or not, this is your ride on the lift. This, right now, is our moment together. Just you and me. And now it is the time of your choice. So here it is. Choose to share the lift and its stories with another. Give this gift freely to someone. And then someone else and so on. Pick one person and tell them to listen. And when the time is right... Pick one more, and then one more again. Watch it change them, as it changed you. There is plenty of room here, so... Let's go for a ride. Together. Hello everyone. My name is Mary. And since Victoria gets to send a message this week, I thought I should be able to as well. So, here it is. I know we don't agree on most things, dear sister, but since it's your birthday, the birthday of your voice, you might say, like something captured by Amber, I thought I should put our disagreements aside long enough to say, Happy birthday, Victoria. Keist, and I am the writer for today's episode of The Lift, a red ring for a winter's eve. If you enjoyed this story, you can find more of my work at GwendolynKeist.com. Find more episodes of The Lift at VictoriasLift.com. I have lost so much. I am bound to this place, charged with guiding those who must choose. Don't be afraid. I can never again be the little girl I was. Will you accept your fate or change it? I have my music box and a library lost, but I sometimes feel very alone. Won't you join me? It's time for your ride on the lift. <laughs> Don't be afraid. If 
Funerals are the worst. All that bland black attire and the handkerchief stabbing swollen eyes and the I'm so sorry for your loss mantras spoken like they really mean something. Like hollow words could ever be enough to change the past. And don't even get me started on those sickly sweet flowers stinking up the parlor or those mournful organ tunes that somehow grate at your ears and make you want to weep at the same time. And for that laundry list of misery, that should be punishment enough, right? But today, it doesn't even come close. Because when the body in the silk-lined casket is your best friend, and that best friend is 16 and pretty, perfect, except for the being dead part. A funeral is way beyond the worst. It's something else entirely. With my heart in my shoes, I stand alone against the far wall in the living room and examine the pattern on the linoleum. Awake. Not that anybody is going to wake up this time around. An old lady wearing a black veil shuffles through the doorway and straight into me, as though I'm air. She blinks up at me and rasps, Are you a member of the family? No, I say, and clasp my hands in front of me. Not exactly. Since the time we were five years old in pigtails, Maggie always called me her sister. But it wasn't true. In a way, we were no one to each other best friends who were practically strangers. Another mourner pulls the old lady with the veil aside. That, she says and points in my direction, was the girl in the car with Maggie. The girl in the car. As the nobody best friend, I don't even get a name. I'm just the one who didn't have the decency to die in Maggie's place. Even the medical examiner says I shouldn't have survived. Yet here I am, too invisible for even death to notice me. But today is the opposite of death for me. Today is my birthday. Seventeen years old. Not that it matters. Not that anyone, even my own parents, remember. Thanks to the accident and the funeral... And all the preparations, the date on the calendar has slipped by everyone. It even slipped by me. It wasn't until I saw it printed on the funeral program that I remembered. January 20th, an Aquarius. A garnet birthstone, my birthday. At least this isn't anything new. I was always easily forgotten. I arrived in the downtime of the year when our tourist town with its lake and jaunty little boardwalk is closed up for the winter. Maggie, on the other hand, was an all-American baby, born in July, when the world is brimming with laughter and fireworks and the scorched scent of barbecue. But now, in the dark of winter, all I can remember is the scorched scent of tires and the strangled sound of my own scream in the passenger seat of Maggie's car, begging her to slow down and knowing that it will do no good. Even now, almost a week after the accident, my voice is still rasping in the back of my throat, pleading with someone who can no longer hear a word, I or anyone else, as to say, Not that Maggie ever bothered to hear anyone if she didn't want to. Happy birthday to me. I hear her somewhere in the house. I'm sure of it. That crystal laugh echoing from deep within the drywall. Like maybe she'll come around the corner any moment. That sly grin on her face. Like this was all part of her plan. Surprise! She'd say, the perfect prankster, and everyone would weep and embrace and give thanks for a merciful God. Nobody would ever blame her for scaring us. 
that would be beside the point. Anyhow, you didn't have to know much in this town to know that Maggie McMillan could do no wrong. That was a rule that might as well have been etched in gold and hung from the courthouse clock tower. Prom queen, debate captain, soon to be valedictorian. She was never afraid of anything. The strong one, the smart one, and now the dead one. But that last moniker should have been mine. All the ER doctors said I was lucky, a miracle, an anomaly. Someone who shouldn't still be. My heart squeezed to tighten my chest. I wander away from the crowd and down the hall. There's only one place to go in the house. The last door on the right. Maggie's bedroom. I half expect her to be there, sitting cross-legged on her polka dot comforter, smiling up at me. You're late, Honora. I can hear her say. You should have been here hours ago, before the other guests arrive. They're such bores, don't you think? Yes, Maggie, I say, answering the question she didn't ask. They're awful. My hands nervous. I rifle through Maggie's things, as though I'm searching for her. Part of me almost believes if I open the correct drawer or flick open the jewelry box in just the right way, I might bring her back to me, unchanged, unfazed, my perfect best friend, returned from the grave. Of course, it's a fool's errand. I can't resurrect her, but I search anyhow. Through the pages of the diary she never bothered to lock, and even in the secret compartment in the back of her jewelry box. She used to hide cigarettes in there, but today, there's something different tucked away. A ring. I turn it over in my hand, the red stone glinting in the soft light of the bedroom. Before I can stop myself, I slip it on my finger. It fits me perfectly. It's a beautiful piece. The jewel is set in a band made of titanium, stronger than steel. Stronger than bone, too. Maggie knows that firsthand. It was a closed casket. After the contortions of the car reshaped her body, that was the only way to bury her with dignity. But even before we put her in the ground this afternoon, she was long gone. She'd slipped away from me a little at a time, and I knew it. I knew I was losing her but I couldn't figure out how to stop it. What are you doing? A rough voice asks behind me. I whirl around to discover Ray, Maggie's boyfriend, hulking in the doorway. The boy she probably would have married, provided she'd lived long enough to graduate and get married or do anything other than die. Everybody loved Ray and loved the two of them together except for me. I wish you two would try to get along, Maggie would always say. But I didn't like him for stealing my best friend. It was petty of me, but it was true. Maggie was already pulled apart like a rag doll. Go to track practice at this time. Study for the AP exam at this time. Be a perfect little teenage dream all the time. And having a boyfriend... Even a passable enough one like Ray was too much for her. She was snapping apart at the seams long before the metal of the car parsed her body into segments. You don't belong in here, Ray says, and inches into the bedroom. Mrs. McMillan doesn't need you mussing things up. (sighs) Like I'm the one messing anything up. I could set this whole room on fire and it wouldn't be the worst thing that happened today. Because today we buried Maggie. We buried my best friend. What are you doing here anyhow? I tuck my hands behind my back so he can't see the ring on my finger. Nothing, I say. Honora, my mother calls from down the hall, 
her voice hoarse from crying. Where are you, honey? The ring burns cold on my finger. I could still put it back. It's not too late. But it feels like mine. It should be mine. Honora? Coming, I say, and slip the ring off my finger. But instead of returning it, I tuck the band in my back pocket, push past Ray in the doorway, and close the bedroom door behind me. That night, after we return home from the funeral, the phone rings. My mother answers, and her voice in the other room is hushed and strange. What's happened, I ask, when she comes in to say goodnight. She hesitates. Maggie's mother didn't want me to tell you. She said it would upset you needlessly. I sit up on my bed. What is it? A ring is missing from Maggie's room. My breath catches in my throat. How did Maggie's mother even know about the ring? Or the secret jewelry box compartment? That's terrible, I murmur and roll over to face the wall. After midnight... I sneak out of my bedroom window and walk down the back alleys of town. Maggie used to meet me on the corner at the far end of her neighborhood, and we would sprint past the boardwalk and down to the lake. Tonight, I go there alone. The docks are quiet in the off-season, and there shouldn't be anyone else here to bother me. But nowhere feels unoccupied now. With every step, It's as though Maggie's with me, watching over me in the way she never bothered to watch over herself. It'll be fine, she said that night in the car. That last night, just before she took the corner too fast, and the dark oak tree rose up like a specter from the earth. You worry too much, Honora. It turns out I didn't worry enough. With her ring on my finger, I crouch on the shore and skip a rock across the slick of the water. This used to be our place, where Maggie and I would come when we were lonely or bored. Day or night, we would bound in circles on the shore around the outline of serene water. Maggie exhaling that crystal laugh of hers and me desperately trying to keep up. I learned young that you could run until your feet were raw, but you would never catch up with her. I'll reach you to the other side, she would always say, and I would know that I'd already lost her. But she didn't lie. She raised me to the other side, all right, and she won. I sit back on my heels, and a shadow coalesces on the shore next to me. I look up, convinced it's Maggie, back to bring me with her. But it's only Ray, with his sullen gaze and his judgment. I thought I'd find you here. I sneer at him, disappointed he's not a ghost. What do you want? He watches me, his jaw set. Maggie's mom called tonight. Yeah, I say, not looking at him now not wanting to give myself away. Something from Maggie's bedroom is missing. Yes, there is, I want to say. Maggie is missing. And from now on, she'll always be missing. That's more important than anything I pilfered. My chest aches, but I just turn back to Ray and shrug. Okay. He steps closer. Did you see anything when you were in there today? But with shadows dancing across his eyes, I know what he really means. Did I take anything when I was in there today? I don't know anything about it, Ray, I say. I try to turn away from him, but he catches my hand. Sure you do, he says. You're wearing it. That's her ring. I wrench myself free and clench my hands into fists. 
You don't know that, I say. You never saw it on her, did you? No, he says. But that's exactly how her mom described it. So, I glare at him again. Maggie and I like to dress alike sometimes. We bought the same things, had the same taste. You can't prove this was hers. You're lying, he says. But I won't listen. I scramble to my feet and start walking, and when that's not enough, I run. I run from the sound of his voice and from his accusations and from all my memories of Maggie. I run like something's chasing me. In a way, something is... At the end of the boardwalk, I sneak through a door of a concession stand. This should be locked, but I'm lucky it's not. Ray will never look for me here. But the instant the door slams shut behind me, I regret hiding here. That's because this isn't the inside of the concession stand. It's the inside of a building. One with tall ceilings and rusted out cornices. Hello? My voice echoes around me. I try the door that led me in here, but it's locked tight now. The whole place is gray, and I fumble through the shadows and the dust, desperate for a way out. All at once, I hit a wall, and a soft light glows overhead. My breath heaves. I'm inside an elevator, and the doors are closing in front of me. I leap forward. But I'm too late, sealed inside like a cadaver in a sepulcher. A tiny voice sings songs overhead. I pound one fist against the wall of the elevator. Stop! I say. And though I'm pretending to be brave, to be a girl more like Maggie, the quiver in my voice gives me away. I edge away from the door. Just stop this thing! I get my wish. The elevator lurches upward and stops. With a rickety sound like a ghost moaning among chains, the elevator door opens and reveals a long hallway with a light at the end. Only, it's not a light. It's a birthday cake, illuminated in the dark, as though it's meant to be my beacon. I creep closer and count the burning candles that are positioned in the shape of a heart. Seventeen. There are seventeen candles on the cake. This is for me. It has to be. You can have a slice if you like. I turn to find a pigtailed girl standing next to me. Who are you? I ask. And what is this place? But she ignores my questions as she strolls toward the cake and starts slicing it into pieces. I hope you like it, she says. It's chocolate lemon. She said that flavor was your favorite. I hesitate. Who told you that? The little girl giggles. (laughs) Who do you think? The ring burns cold on my finger again. Maggie. Maggie is here. Hello, I whisper to the walls, but no one there responds. Instead, the little girl takes her turn to answer my questions. My name is Victoria, and this is my home. I'm Honora, I say, though I don't know why I'm introducing myself to this strange little wraith. She smiles. That's a pretty name. Would you like a corner piece? It is your birthday after all. I nod, and she serves me a more than generous slice. As she cuts, she trims around the still burning candles. We eat our cake in silence. When she's done, she licks the icing off the rim of her plate. I know it's your birthday, but you shouldn't have done that. I squint at her in the glow of the candles. Done what? You shouldn't take something that isn't yours. I tumble backwards and hit the wall. How does she know about the ring? It wasn't yours either, I half stammer, 
So what difference does it make to you? Victoria smiles. It makes quite a bit of difference. You don't understand, I say and clutch the ring into my chest. This might as well be mine. She would have given it to me. I know she would have. Maybe that's true. But you didn't ask. Victoria nods as if to herself. She never gave me a chance. Maggie never gave me a chance to do a lot of things. She was good at so much. At being smart and successful and beautiful. But she was impatient too. She wanted everything now. Everything better. Everything faster. And that's how I lost her. She was too careless. But in that last moment, she thought of me. She turned the wheel, and the driver's side swiped into the tree. She saved my life. And that makes everything so much worse. Just wanted her to stay. I whisper, tears salting my cheeks. She says she didn't mean to leave you, Victoria says. She says she's sorry. I'm sorry too. The candles are still burning on the cake. Victoria smiles sweetly at me. It's time for you to make a wish. I close my eyes and heave out a breath. When I look again, I'm standing on Maggie's front porch. This is where I belong. There's something I need to do. I knock on the door and her mother answers. At first, I say nothing. I just slip the ring from my finger and hold it out. She takes it from me and turns it over in her hand. I found it. I say, my cheeks flushed and my gaze on the welcome mat. Then I shake my head. No. No. It's not right, and I know it. I look at her mother and stand a little taller. I didn't find it. I took it. The words ache in my mouth, but there it is. The truth. Maggie's mother glances up at me, night shadows cutting strange curves into her face. I see, is all she says. The wind coils around me and I inhale a ragged breath. How did you know what was missing from the jewelry box? In the secret compartment is what I mean. A small, sad smile curls on her mother's lips. I was young once, too. Remember? My chest constricts. And I understand for the first time... Those cigarettes were never a secret either. Nothing was ever a secret. What fools we were to think we were so clever. Thank you, Honora, her mother says. You were a good friend to her. I swallow a heavy sob, but it wasn't enough. She clasps her hands around mine. But you did your best. You loved her. And she knew it right until the end. She knew it. Trembling, she places the ring in my palm and closes my fingers around it. My stomach lurches and I shake my head. I can't take this. But it belongs to you, she says, for your birthday. I was with Maggie when she bought it for you. My breath clogs in my throat. The red jewel. It's a garnet for my birthstone. She remembered, I whisper and almost laugh to myself. I stole something that already belonged to me. Maggie, always the prankster, would love that. I walk home in the dark taking the long way there past the lake that's never felt so lonesome. But this time, I'm not alone. Ray's there. I thought you'd come back, he says. 
I called Maggie's mom and told her what happened. But she says it was your ring all along. I nod. From Maggie, for my birthday. He sighs. <sighs> I guess I was wrong about you. No, I say and shake my head. You weren't wrong. He was right. I'm a thief, common as dirt. It just turns out I'm not very good at it. Although it's the middle of January, the air is crisp and clean and welcoming. The perfect night. The kind Maggie and I always loved so much. But now she's gone, and it's just me and Ray. I wish you two would try to get along, she would say. I look at Ray and smile. I'll race you to the other side. And with that, I turn and spring down the sandy shore, with him running behind me, and a far away crystal laugh whipping on the wind. big thank you to all of you for listening to the show to all of you who take the time to rate and review the show in itunes and stitcher and every place else and to all of our patreon supporters without your generous contributions it would be nearly impossible to put this show together full show notes with credits links and artwork can be found at victoriaslift.com we make other podcasts you might enjoy check out the wickedlibrary.com and also ninthstory.com for links to other shows. If you're on social media, you can check us out on Facebook and also on Twitter. And if you'd like to make sure you don't miss future episodes of the show, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Google Play, lots of places. Now available from K.B. Goddard, the author of The Lift episode The Lost Library and The Wicked Library episodes The Darkness Within and Shadows, comes her debut novella, The Girl with the Roses. At the haunted auctions of Thornhill and Swift, where artifacts of the ghostly and the macabre are bought and sold, we learn of the statue entitled The Girl with the Roses. Charlotte Salt has always dreamt of marrying for love, but when she receives a proposal, she realizes that romance isn't always the deciding factor in the Victorian marriage market. Married to the eligible but secretive George Avery, she finds herself cut off from her family and friends when her husband takes her to live in his isolated Derbyshire home. Trapped in a loveless marriage, she finds her thoughts turning towards her brother's newly returned friend, the handsome Charles Jameson. In failing health and increasingly troubled by strange sights and sounds, she cannot help recalling Jameson's mysterious warning, Be on your guard. What danger did he foresee? As dark forces surround her, she contemplates the fate of her predecessor. What happened to the first Mrs. Avery? In a summer of storms, can anyone save her from the shadows? The Girl with the Roses is now available for pre-order on Amazon and Kobo. Society 13 Podcast Network. Redefining Podcasts. Society-13.com Do you like to listen?